Hello, welcome to the second part of the handling state in Haskell. We have finished um, previous section on re-implementing the parser which handles the uh, tokens and handles the uh, start and stop of the comment which is ignored. Uh, so here we have the implementation which is uh, using a program state and the program state uses uh, a state monad to keep track of the current working stack and at the same time keeping track of the uh, logical uh, handling of the of the comment such that if we are ignoring um, the inside of the comment section uh, we are not processing the tokens and we are just flipping the, the state. Um, that is a little bit too complex to uh, explain uh, exactly what, what happens with the state. So let's do a little bit of an extra diversion uh, or di di digression. Um, and let's talk a little bit about uh, what we can do with computation uh, and how can we enclose computation into kind of a unit which we can do some stuff with. So let's have um, let's have a section which I will kind of call extras, and let's first let's define a very uh, traditional um, way of calculating Fibonacci numbers in, in Haskell, such that we have a reference implementation to compare us with. So let's have a, a Fibonacci uh, infinite Fibonacci sequence, which will uh, effectively be a number. Uh, a list of numbers and to define our Fibonacci series we will start with zero and then we have the the rest of the sequence where uh, rest equals so the first element is zero the next one has has to be one and then we have to add those two numbers such that our sequence is the the fifth sequence and the rest sequence are kind of moving uh, forward and they are offset by one and we adding those two uh, last elements. So we will say zip width plus and then we will add the FIP elements with the rest elements such that we have our Fibonacci. So that provides us with the infinite uh, Fibonacci sequence. Re excellent. So if I do a test, I can check if FIP element. So element 0 is 0, element 1 is 1, element 2 is 0 plus 1, which is 1, and then element 3 will be 2. So if I do that, then I should get two as an out outcome. Um, I also know from memory, I have been playing with this for a while, that if I do the Fibonacci number 10th, then I will get number 55. We also can do a test saying if we do take 5 out of fib, then we should get a list which will have number 0, 1, 1, and then 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3. So how many we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, let's do one more. So then we have 5 here and we say 6. All right. So we have our tests done. Uh, we can check if that works, but I'm not gonna run the tests now. Let's focus on the state. So um, normal functions take um, an argument and then produce uh, an argument and you can chain them in such a way that you pass the resulting argument into the input of the you know, consecutive function. Um, with the monadic um, encapsulation of computation, we have um, 
kind of an ability to maintain a state between the, the calls of the functions. So yeah, it, it's a little bit difficult to explain. So let me just show you a, an example. So we have an alternative implementation of Fibonacci computation. So um, let's call it the original or oh, the functional, let's say, such that I will have fit functional, fit functional, fit functional, that's fine. And then let's do um, a fit, which will calculate for us a single operation of adding two numbers, such that we can chain it and calculate as deeply as we as we want. So this is similarly to how you would implement it in an imperative way, where you keep track of the pair of numbers and you update. You, you have two variables, like you know uh, we starting with zero and one, uh, and then you kind of updating the state such that you um, keep track of the sum and then of the higher number, the sum and the higher number, and so on. So what we will do is we will have a Fibonacci computation, which will be a state and the state monad takes um, and encapsulates some context, some sort of environment in which the computation happened to produce a, a resulting value. So our resulting value is an integer. Um, and then the context is a pair of numbers that we need to add. Um, so we will say it's also an integer. An integer. So we have, in as a context, we have two integers, and then we just need to add them to obtain the final value out of the computation of a single step of the Fibonacci sequence, right? So our fib equals do, and as with many monadic operations, we have this kind of a, a do notation, which simplifies for us how we obtain the inner values from from the from the monad. Um, and in this particular case, if I go to Google and I search for a state monad, I will see transformers. Yeah, that that's better. Um, so let's see. So you see that um, um, yeah, that's the monad state. Yeah, it is kind of the same, but let me see. I don't want the state. Where is it? Yeah, let's see this one. Yeah, that we're gonna get. Yeah, so we we have the the state monad. Um, it is kind of defined in the uh, using the state um, monad transformer. But let's um, focus on um, the two operations that I need. So um, one operation that I want is to get the state out of the um, you know, um, um, the computation that we have. So get kind of fetches the current value of the state of the computation. Um, so the, the state is this sort of the, the context. Uh, and then uh, put puts uh, sets the, the, the state within the monad. So it kind of uh, puts something back. So it's, it's uh, you have two um, operations, symmetric operations. One is for storing and one is for, for reading it. Um, and then we have, um, we have those uh, operations for actually computing, but let's not get ahead of us uh, yet. So to get the state, remember the state is two numbers. Um, so let's call them A and B. What I need to do is I need to do this um, assignment of the get function. So the get function will get me 
the current state of my state monad here. Uh, and then what I can do is I can update it uh, because I know um, I'm, I'm storing the values kind of a smaller one on the left hand side and the higher one on the right hand side. So I know that B is the higher one. So imagine that I have zero and one here. Then what I will end up if I do the, the single operation on the, on the Fibonacci sequence, I will get the higher one on the left hand side now and I will get the sum being on the right hand side, right? So I have, um, uh, let's see. So I started with zero one and by a single step, I kind of transformed it into one, one, because um, I did the sum. So I have the right element now on the left hand side and the sum on the right hand side. If I were to do a second step, so if I did the second step, I would end up with one, two. And then if I do a third step, I would have um, two, three. Uh, and then if I did another one, I would have three, five, right? So you, you kind of see the pattern, right? So uh, this is my initial state, kind of a state zero. And this FIP is state one, which is this one. And I can chain it so you will see it in a moment. So I'm putting it back, but because the um, the FIP computation needs to produce a value, I need to return what is the, the current value out of this after iterating over th this step, right? So the current value is return A plus B. So that, that's my, um, th this is my current value from uh, doing this uh, single step. Uh, why do you complain? Do you need to be in brackets? Yes, you do. Right, so we have a single step for our Fibonacci uh, computation and then we would like to be able to do the step nth. So for example here, if I were to implement lib f the nth Fibonacci number, I need to give it a number and it will be uh, effectively fib f and I'm just accessing that particular element out of my infinite sequence. So lib fn um, takes an int and produces um, an a and a is number, right? Because we kind of, uh, we are agnostic about the actual type. Uh, so that will do. And then for this one, we want the same, so we want a Fibonacci and it takes a number and it will give me the current value out of the Fibonacci sequence. Um, so this function takes an int and produces a state again of integer, integer and the value integer. All right, so to implement it, what we need to do is we need to take a number and we need to because again we will be operating with the state here so we do a do notation to make it more concise you could of course rewrite it using the bindings uh, but it would be a little bit less readable so remember that fib if, if i do a fib once right so if i do fib um if I do fib once, it will modify my context by one step. So I can do fib twice, fib, you know, uh, three times, and then I can get again, I can get the current state of the computation. Uh, and because I don't care about the left number, I only care about the right number. So I, I would say like this. Um, and then I would return uh, the current value of the computation using that um, pattern, right? So I can chain my steps of computations uh, by calling the FIP multiple times, or, you know, normally what you do is you might have some multiple functions that operate on the state. Um, 
in our case, you know, it's a Fibonacci sequence, so we don't need multiple functions, but if it's a program state, like for example here, uh, we have multiple functions operating on the state monad, uh, and they kind of update the internal state when they are called. So it, it kind of happens the same here. Uh, and because I need to do it n, like num number of times, then I would say replicate and because I'm not replicating elements of the list, I have to say M and then say number of times and they say FIB. So I'm replicating um, the, um, the FIB call uh, num number of times um, to get the, the result. Um, I need to import replicate M so it says it's in control monad state lazy. So I will, um, so I am importing it. Uh, so replicate M gets into my list and I need to, to kind of demonstrate that it works. I need to uh, import fibf, fibfn and fibn, fibn. So let's import all those um, not import, export uh, all those fib functions. So I have fib, uh, fib, f, fib, f, fib, n. Yeah. Uh, and fib, fib, f, n. I'm missing it. Let's see. Fib, f. FIP, FN, FIP, and FIP, N. Yeah, that looks correct to me. What you don't like. Yeah, I already have FIP, F. So what did I mistype? Lip. Oh, yeah. All right. No, it's not lip. It's FIP. All right. So I have... Um, returns an nth element of the Fibonacci sequence and this one also um, returns an nth element of the Fibonacci Sequence, uh, excellent. So let's delete those. Returns nth element of the Fibonacci sequence and we have the alternative implementation. Why do you complain? You complain because uh, this replicate, comp uh, um, I'm, you know, I'm doing the FIP computation n num num number of times and I will get the result. And it complains that I'm not doing anything with the result. So I have to, to kind of get rid of the warning I say, okay, I don't care about the result. Um, we could effectively care about the result and return it without doing that extra step, right? So we can compact this because we are getting, um, that will actually return as a value. So we can directly say uh, return and because it is the last uh, element of the call, we don't really need to do that. So it will um, do what we really want. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so it doesn't do what we really want because it will kind of, um, uh, yeah, so it returns a list of the results, not a single result, and we would need to do something with it. So let's say we don't care about this. Let's get the, the state the state as it is now, uh, get and we return B. All right, so we back to the original implementation. There is one extra thing that I have to do. So um, remember that um, if I say um, pip f, uh, yeah, let's let's show it. So if I go uh, stack GCI. Right, so if I do um, pip and I, I say 
take five or take six elements out of the FIP sequence, FIP F. Then I have my uh, six elements of the Fibonacci sequence. Um, so that works. And then I have the FIP F N function. And if I tell it, give me the six element, uh, it gives me eight because uh, we index things from, from zero, right? So the six element is the one after those two, and that will be eight. So now if I do FIP, FIP N uh, here with the six element. Um, okay, so um, per first of all, remember that uh, here the, the FIP is already doing one step. So it's not like after just calling FIP, I'm not in state zero, I'm in state one, right? So I have to replicate um, uh, the FIP one less time than I would normally because I've already done the single step here. Uh, so like, you know, I, I have, um, I'm re re repeating FIP, but I already did, did it once, right? So I, I have to do this minus. And then the second thing is that um, I can call it but it produces a state and state doesn't have a show um, a type class. So it doesn't uh, display itself. So what I can do is I can say, okay, my computation C is FIP N six times, um, but I cannot display it, uh, but I can get value out of it, right? So I can then display the value. So I have my computation. It's doing the Fibonacci computation uh, as prescribed by the by those two functions so by replicating the steps and then to actually get a value out of it i have to evaluate it to to a value so i can um so now we have those uh those functions which are called run state and run state takes uh the state computation some initial state and produces a, a tuple with the final value and the and the state. Um, I can evaluate the state and uh, again call it with the with the state um, computation with the initial state. But then I, I get the final value out of it, right? So eval state is what we want. We want to compute the final value uh, by giving it the initial state. So what I can do with C is I can call eval state and pass the, the computation and pass the initial state. And, of, you know, we starting the computations with the pair of numbers, which is zero and one. Um, so our initial state is zero and one, and then we calling eval state on that. Um, I cannot call eval state yet because I didn't include. So if you try, it will complain that eval state is not in scope. So I have to import it. So I have to say uh, control monad state. All right. So now we can do eval state C and the initial value zero and one. And we can compute um, the, um, the final value, which is 13 which is eight plus five. So we are off by one. Um, let's see one more time. So let me just write it here such that we see pip n of six. Um, yeah, did I update the, yeah, let me just double check that I've updated, the, that I've reloaded. Yeah, I didn't. So if we do that, yeah, we lost the, right. So we have FIP N and we're doing the six iterations with this uh, initial state. Um, and we have value eight as a result, which is the same as doing the FIP, uh, FIP functional N six. It also gives us eight. So our two functions now, uh, the one using the state monad and the one uh, with the infinite sequences are producing the same result. So let's double check that number 10, the 10th element also works. So that should be 55. 
and then with the state evaluation if i do the tenth it also produces 55. so now those two implementations are kind of probably equivalent and one is using uh an infinite sequence of uh, fibonacci numbers and then I, i'm just getting a particular number out of it um and the other computation is using the state monad and it demonstrates how can you enclose a particular computation into a state monad with a particular context and a computed computed value and how you can kind of prepare a single step and then how you can chain it or um, you know uh, combine multiple functions that operate on that state and retain the internal state of the um, of this monadic computation between the subsequent calls to the to the functions so as you see um, i'm calling fit but i'm not really passing any parameters it's kind of uh encapsulated in that in that state uh state monad such that i get kind of the carry over of the internal state uh, and i can access it using the the get and you know update it using the put so this is kind of a pattern that you can use for your own implementations every time that you need to retain a particular state or you know mut mutable state between uh subsequent processing or subsequent computations that eventually produce some final result um so this is uh what um i was planning to to talk about the state and then state t is basically exactly the same functionality but it provides you the ability to have a value the computed value being embedded in a, a different monad so you have your your normal state monad uh, on the outside and then you also have the sort of the the computation which will produce eventually uh something else embedded in a in in a, in a different monadic context and for for example we could uh include an io um and normally you cannot do that right you cannot uh combine uh the monad to have uh a monadic value but if i change it to state t then i can um yeah i will need to import it um yes please import that um and then i have an ability to do a computation um and this computation kind of will eventually produce an io integer not just an integer and that gives me an ability to operate on the io monad now right so uh at each step i can for example do lift and i can print a current value of what we um currently computed right so i can yeah i have to import that as well Mm, yes so now um yeah i need to change that to be io and state t so now what will happen is if i run uh let's try reloading this and let's try to run uh fip fip n 10 times again um we uh, yes what do you want yeah let's see i missed something maybe mm. It expects state. Why it expects state? I did change this. Yeah, let's see. Maybe that not everything was updated. No, it was updated. Yeah, that looks fine we could try uh lift io that's a they should do the same thing um 
Let's try again. Yes, so let's see. Let's try to do this now. Um, Pip N. Yeah, it takes the state and it produces the integer. So the types are okay. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe there is. Uh... That's right. So I was missing a T. So uh, eval state operates on the you know it, it basically complains that uh, the expected type was state monad, not state t uh, for the eval state function. So I, I need to use um, the the other one. So if we rerun it, uh, we will see that as a side effect, it actually produces all the intermediate uh, Fibonacci. So so the final one. That one is the output of just doing this, the, the evaluation. And then all those ones are the, the calls that we kind of did here. Um, yeah, I don't probably, I should be fine just with lifting um, into the IO monad. So you can, um, yeah, let's double check it that I'm not lying. Yeah, so it works fine. So. As you see, um, the state T allows you to kind of embed um, your result into a, a different monadic context and you can kind of access that monadic context by lifting from within your current context into this new uh, monadic context and do some operations there. And if, if you try to do print, of course, it will kind of complain that um, it couldn't match um, you know, because print operates within the IO monad. So it basically says, okay, uh, couldn't match the IO monad that print expects with the state T monad that we are currently in. So by doing this do notation, I'm within the state T monad. And then to do something with the IO, with, with this one, I basically have to uh, lift myself out of the current context into into this one. So that's why we uh, we using um, the lift uh, function to kind of uh, allow us to do some operations within that context now. Um, so those two are very powerful mechanisms, uh, the kind of the chaining of the monads and also the state monad itself or state T uh, monad transformer. So uh, yeah, use it, um, have fun with it. And then there are additional two, um, two monads. Uh, with equivalent reader T and uh, writer T equivalents uh, for embedding additional uh, monadic contexts. And they basically are the same as state monad, but they are designed for either read only or write only situations. So here we have the, our context and we sort of expect to be reading and writing from the context uh, because we have the, those uh, put uh, and get methods uh, where we kind of updating the context and, and uh, reading from it. Uh, and the reader and writer are kind of the two sides of the same pattern, but designed for either reading or writing. So if you uh, go again to the... Um, if you search for a reader, um, yeah, that's probably what we want. Yeah, this one. So a reader has um, kind of like with with the state, we have two methods, uh, get and put. 
with the reader, we have kind of one method which retrieves us the environment and you can uh, chain um, various functions in such a way that you can pass a particular environment to all of them without explicitly passing the parameter all the time. So it's a very useful pattern when you need to chain uh, a sequence of computations, but you have some sort of a global state or global name or global variable that all of them need to kind of read from or have access to such that instead of passing it all the way through your chain, you can kind of embed it into the reader um, uh, computation context and then all of them will be able to say ask and get this kind of environment from from your from your computational context. Um, the um, the other one, the other side of the of the equation is the writer. So if I uh, let's do duplicate type tap and do the writer. So the writer is um, where is it? Tu, 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 tu. Mm. I, I, I have trouble. Yeah, let's see here. So a writer has um, a tell function. Yeah, this one, which is used to write into a single context. So for example, for uh, let's say you have your program and you want to log um, error messages, uh, then kind of a writer can allow you to have a kind of a single sync, single context into which you can kind of tell uh, particular items and it will kind of produce the, the final, uh, um, yeah, the, the final environment which has all those things that you tell told it right so you have a method tell which is for writing and then uh, you can use the the writer pattern for updating the environment by calling tell uh, with the reader you you can kind of uh, consume something here you can produce uh, and the state is like both together uh, because you have the get and put together right uh, and and you can um, do them at yeah within the same computational context so if you have a situation where like for example logging uh where you um you know are predominantly just putting stuff out into the context then you use a, a writer uh, monad if you have a situation where you need to consume some config file or some config variables then you can use the reader one and then in in this particular case when you want something to be uh, both then you can use the state so I hope that kind of makes sense and that you can um, you can try it out and, and have a little bit of fun. And in the context of the assignment, uh, uh, the, um, the next assignment, you can probably benefit from having this type of uh, encapsulation such that you can make your computation a little bit better. Um, I've implemented the, the, um, the process tokens. Um, um implementation here so if i call main i can make you a short demo so the calculator works the same as before so you can kind of uh, compute uh simple operations with plus and multiplication um you can have you can handle errors so if i have an error uh it will kind of uh, put um um it will put the error uh, onto the stack, but it will continue. So I have an error, then I put two and three on the stack and then I do multiplication. So I end up with the right six on the, on the top of the stack and the error beneath it. Uh, of course I, I still, oh, whoops, I still have the pop so I can, uh, pop the error and then do two or three multiplication. So then I will end up just with right six. But now I can also do something like do a computation and then say uh, this is to be ignored. Close the comment and then uh, I have uh, on top of, of the stack 6 and I can put 10 and multiply 6 by 10. So I should end up with 60 and no errors because the comment is kind of uh, enclosed in the, um, in the opening 
a quote and the closing quote and then all those things in with inside I ignored and then I just get the, the final answer. So where, while I'm parsing like what not, not actually parsing while I'm processing the tokens and I hit the first opening um, uh, quote, I change the state to ignore all the subsequent tokens until I hit the closing one. And then I flip the state again and then I still start processing the uh, the tokens as normal. Uh, so to keep track of in which state in ignore state or non-ignored state I am, uh, I have this uh, ignore uh, boolean variable inside my state which I flip um the moment i have i hit the um the quote character so i kind of uh, flip it from the current state to the opposite um the code is not that nice uh, i i am kind of thinking how this could be improved how this could be made a little bit nicer uh, i have this sort of nested if um, um checks so yeah, if you have some ideas of how this could be made nicer, uh, please uh, please share. Uh, also, um, you will notice that for like my program state currently is the this bool, and then the current version of the stack with the final version of the stack, right? Uh, for all those operations, the actual um, state of parsing is irrelevant because they operate on program state but they kind of ignore uh, what the boolean flag is doing like they they don't really use it they just pass it through right so again it's something that probably could be done with a, a reader monad maybe uh, such that I can kind of check what what it is and those functions which don't use it they don't need to ask about it um, so in here you see I'm getting this and I'm passing it through but I'm not using it anywhere. Uh, so yeah, the code sort of smells a little bit. Uh, I haven't figured out how to make it a little bit nicer but it works and it is not too bad. So if you have some ideas, just make a pull request and uh, improve, uh, do refactoring here. Um, otherwise that's it. So thanks thanks a lot for, um, for, this, for this session and uh, we'll see you in, in class. Bye.